Good morning, Rivers of Life Church family. Here are your announcements for the week of January 10th, 2021. On Saturday, men, you have your fellowship via Zoom. Saturday, January 16th at 9 a.m. The Zoom room opens at 8.30 a.m. For details on how to log in, you can email mensfellowship at rolcm.org or look out for a one call with more information. And those are your announcements for the week. Get ready to get blessed by the Word of God, ministered by Rev. Glenn Hand, after this selection from our special guest artist, Chelsea Green. Thank you. 
Good Sunday morning, Rivers of Life Church family. Welcome, welcome to our online ministry on this day. I am Reverend Glenn Hand, and it is my honor and privilege to bring the Word of God to you on this morning. So, without taking up too much time, pre-mark your Bibles to Judges chapter 6, the Gospel of Mark chapter 8, but we will begin in Genesis. We'll begin in Genesis chapter 2. It's where we'll find our foundational scripture. So let us pray and dig into the word of God and see what God has for us on this morning. Father God, we bless your holy and righteous name and give you all, all the honor, praise, and glory that's due you. For you are God and you are God all by yourself. So Father, on this day, I ask you to remove anything from me that is not of you, any of my thoughts or my ideas, and I ask you to fill your Holy Spirit into me and into the words that come that come forth on this day and have your Holy Spirit truly be the teacher on this day and never myself. We bind the enemy on this day through the power and authority that we have through your word, Father, and we thank you for that. We allow nothing to get in the way of your word going forth in power on might and might on this morning, and we thank you for that authority. We thank you for that power. We thank you for your love and your Holy Spirit. And it is in Jesus' name we pray and we give thanks. Amen and amen again. Now, on this morning, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> and we're going, to, we're going to be looking at, well, we're going to be looking at a few things. We're going to be looking at two stories in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at what happens in the Garden of Eden, right? How the relationship of humanity and God gets fractured. And we'll try to examine why. We're also then going to look at a community that has forgotten God and the effects that that has on that particular community and who God uses, who God uses to bring that community back. And then finally, we will go into the New Testament, into the Gospel of Mark, and we will look at the best advice we can get from anyone, and that's from Jesus himself, on the importance of discipleship, but how we get to discipleship. So let's start in, in Genesis chapter 2. And I read starting at chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 15. And it, it says this. Then the Lord God took the man, that's Adam we're talking about, and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. To tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, every one. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Why? God tells him why. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's God's command. So, it's pretty specific. God, has, God creates a place for humans to be. A pl and, and he commands humans to tend and keep it. But he has some restrictions as well. He has one particular dis uh, restriction in, in our foundational scriptures here. There's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm trying to protect you from that. So stay away from that, because the day that, that you, you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean a physical death. You, we can have emotional death. We can have spiritual death. But it's a type of death, if not a physical death. So you can title this message, Tend Your Garden. Tend Your Garden. And my ob objective is this. <clears throat> it's a bit lengthy, but... Uh, it, this is my objective, to inform and remind us all of the role God expects us to play in our homes and our communities and the consequences society pays when we abdicate those roles and to encourage, I want to encourage us all to discipleship with God and the restoration that follows discipleship and the restoration that follows discipleship. So the roles we play, men and women alike, 
And the roles that we don't play are consequential. Right? There are consequences, both good and bad, for what we do, our choices. And discipleship with God, our God, discipleship with our Jesus, discipleship with our Holy Spirit is restorative. It will restore. It will preserve as long as you keep that connection open. Hmm? If that connection is broken, discipleship is restorative. What you think you've lost, you will regain. In fact, what you think you need might even change. So let's talk about Eden for a second. Now, our concept of Eden, at least my concept used to be, <clears throat> paradise, uh, I believe many of us have the wrong idea of what God intended our roles uh, as men and women to be. Uh, in our 21st century American pursuit of happiness mentality, our cultural ideal of consumering, I think many of us have the mental image of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, kind of sitting in cabana chairs, sipping drinks with little umbrellas on them, uh, soaking up the sun and doing nothing but relaxing and having nice conversations with, between themselves and God. Right? It was paradise. Right? Our idea of paradise is everything is perfect. But I would offer and argue that there's nothing further from the truth. We were created, both man and woman, to work together as a team. So now in that foundational, special, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 15 says this, The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden, and to tend and to keep it. To tend and to keep it. There's two Hebrew words there. One is abad, and the root meaning of abad means to work or to till, to make fertile, right? And the other word is shamar. Shamar, the root meaning is to protect or to guard or to watch. So the garden was to be worked. It was to be productive. It was to be maintained. Right? I think I, I, I sometimes say everybody wants to build, but no one wants to do maintenance. It wasn't going to take care of itself. God wasn't going to take care of it. God created it. The Bible tells us God now rested. God didn't put it on automatic pilot for Adam and Eve, or for humanity by extension. Adam was expected to work it, and Eve was an equal partner. The garden was to be protected and to be guarded. Now, if something needs to be tended, it means it's not going to produce on its own. You need to tend it, take care of it, right? But it needs to be guarded as well. And this is interesting because <clears throat> that infers that there was something in creation that the garden needed protection from. Something that wanted to do it harm. Something that desired to sabotage humanity's relationship with God. And it was going to take some diligent on humanity's part to keep the garden and everyone in it safe. So Adam was charged with this important primary responsibility from God. Two directives. And God expected Adam to carry them out before any others. To work the garden, to cultivate and maintain the garden, to protect it from whatever would seek to destroy it. And to not eat, in addition, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One prohibition. Well, I would, I would argue that, that that expectation hasn't changed with God. We still must tend and keep, protect and guard, till and work together, man and woman, as equal partners. So, again, Eden wasn't perfect, all right? Eden was not perfect, not in our understanding of perfect. At any rate, how could it have been? Humans were there, and there was a serpent in paradise. What it was, it was a perfect opportunity. Unfortunately, it became a lost opportunity because of what had become known as the next 
stage of this, of our narrative, our story, is the fall. And I would pre uh, suppose and, and pre warn us and, and say that don't blame Eve, which sometimes happens. This is what's known as a, a decline narrative. We have the creation, and we have humans with this grand possibility of this relationship with the creator of all things. As I say, it says, come let us reason together. And now it declines. It gets broken. And it gets broken for, for a reason. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 says this, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of, of, the, of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, God didn't say not to touch it. God said, don't eat it. Now, of course, I understand you have to touch it to eat it. But Eve adds this. Now, did she add it on her own, or did Adam misinform her? Because, remember, the command went to Adam, not to Eve. So God had spoken to Adam. Adam must have either related incorrectly or not related at all, or Eve adds this other admonition. We like to add things, subtract things. The word is what it is for a reason. And the serpent, of course, counter-argues, says, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day of it you will eat, uh, in that day, rather, you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when Eve, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So here's Adam. He's present. He's not somewhere else. Adam does not intercede. Remember, Adam didn't, doesn't correct her. Adam doesn't get in the way and say, Look, you're my enemy. You create, you're creating havoc here. You're trying to re create com uh, chaos. And you're trying to break our relationship with God. No, he takes the fruit and he eats it as well. So he wasn't tending. And he certainly wasn't guarding. Okay? <clears throat> as I said, Eve wasn't there when God informed Adam whether or not Adam told Eve he was responsible to protect Eve and the garden. And he just stood there and ate. Trust with God is broken, the decline narrative. He abdicated his primary role and there were consequences. Then, uh, there were consequences then and there are consequences now. When we are out of position with God, as men and women, all right? Everyone suffers. There's a ripple effect. Adam empowered the enemy. Right? Remember that. The enemy is a defeated foe. We can only empower him. Give him agency. And this is a basic story. It's a bottom line story. A man, a woman, God, and a choice. So, now let's take a look at what happens when an entire community is out of position. Men and women without the right, right, right relationship with God or no relationship at all with God, disconnected from God and as a result of the same choice made in Eden, breaking trust with God, outside forces are wreaking havoc in the lives of the children of Israel. So let's meet, well, most of us have already met, but let's talk about Gideon. So let's go to chapter 6 of the book of Judges. 
Now, a little background before uh, we get to Gideon. <clears throat> the Israelites, children of God, have turned their back on God. The first uh, verse, verse 1, says this, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is a recurring theme in the book of Judges. All right? We hear this phrase also in other books in the Old Testament. But the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. I think it's seven times in the book of Judges that that particular phrase is used. And there are consequences. So they are under attack by Midian, and it says for seven years. And they are hiding in the hills, uh, and they are uh, not, their crops are, are, are stolen and, and destroyed, their cattle, their possessions. They are a community in trouble, and they are a community without God. So once we, when we meet Gideon in verse 11, says this, now the angel of the Lord, and that capital letter Lord, if you're looking in your Bible, that capital letter Lord uh, is the Tetragrammaton, and pastor has talked about the Tetragrammaton, that is Yahweh, right? Uh, pious Jews would not even say that name, right? <clears throat> so now the angel of the Lord, and I point that out because there's something that changes, shifts in, in the narrative, and I think it's an important point. Now the angel of the Lord come, came and sat under the terebinth tree, uh, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abiazrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress. While Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress, in order to hide it from the Midianites. So, imagine Gideon, what he must look like, right? This is like famine. No one is eating, right? They're under siege. He must be gaunt, right? He must be underfed. Uh, he, he's going to describe himself as the least of the least. Uh, and he's desperate. And he is threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You, you stomp grapes in a wine press. But what a wine press allows you to do is hide. So he's definitely out of position, and he's living in fear, right? Gideon's threshing wheat in a wine press. The people are in hiding in mountain clefts and caves and strongholds. They, as a community, are living in fear. They have turned their back on God. So Gideon has this conversation with the angel of the Lord. Verse 12 says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. You mighty man of valor, he calls him. Remember the description that we just had of Gideon. Gideon says to him, O oh my Lord, small l, which is Adonai, if the Lord, capital L, Yahweh, is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And that's a good question from Gideon's point of view, but he is missing the bigger picture. There, <laughs> uh, it wasn't that God left them. They left God, right? And where are all his miracles which our fathers taught us about and told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So, <clears throat> so we have these ideas in our head when we are upset or not happy with God that it is somehow God's fault, hmm. right? And then we, he sarcastically, I, I can hear him saying this sarcastically. Where are all these miracles? Which our fathers told him, oh, where is he? Where's all this stuff? You see where I am? I'm in a wine press here, threshing meat, uh, wheat. So that's uh, verse 13. A shift happens in verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So it's no longer the angel of the Lord that's speaking. It is God. But Gideon doesn't recognize it yet. He doesn't recognize God. He doesn't recognize that he's speaking to God. Right? So, but sir, he says, 
to the angel, who am I? Right? Well, he's going to tell you what he thinks he is. Right? How can I, verse 15. So he said to him, after this, still doesn't know it's God speaking now. Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Okay? That's his idea of himself. That's what, how he sees himself. And he doesn't recognize yet that this is God now speaking to him. I'm wondering if we take this as a metaphor for our prayer life, right? In our prayer life, if we, come to, if we only come to God when it's, a, when it's a 911 situation, right, and have the expectation of God somehow uh, performing a miracle, not that God can't perform miracles, but our expectations are sometimes are unfair because we don't keep our side of the covenant, our side of the bargain, right? <clears throat> now, what if sometimes in a shallow walk, with God, and your prayer life is just a 911 prayer life. Is that a conversation with God you're having? Or is that just a conversation you're having with yourself? I don't have the answer to that, I just offer it. Give you that one for free. So, he understands at some point that this is God. He gets scared because he knows, he knows the Bible. He knows the word, right? He knows about the stories. He knows about God and, and freeing the people of Israel from, from Egypt, the children of Israel. <clears throat> so he knew about God, but he didn't know God. He also knew that it was written in the scriptures that if you see God, you die. And God assures him that you're not going to die. So... So let's review. We've got, you've got the wrong man for the job, he says. My tribe is weak, scared, and hiding. My family is the weakest family in the tribe. I'm the weakest in the family. What, do you ask, what you're asking me to do is impossible. God's in the impossible business, whether we know it or not, no matter how we see ourselves. Gideon saw himself as weak. God called him a mighty man of valor. Abraham's wife Sarah was too old to conceive. Jeremiah was too young to be a prophet. Moses stuttered. Mary was unmarried. Paul persecuted Christians. Isn't it funny that God keeps showing up in the lives of the doubtful, the skeptical, and the incompetent people and expecting great things from them? Gideon's problem is fear. He thought he knew who he was and what his limitations were. We all do that very same thing. I can't do this. What will other people think of me? But God ignores the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, about who we are. Gideon thought he knew who he was. He was the least of the least. God knows us differently. God knows us deeper. Once we understand that trusting God Building, maintaining, protecting that relationship with him, fear no longer rules us. Paul wrote in Romans, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We have value in God's eyes. God says you are worth it, my son, my daughter. We allow things to come between us and God. Our flesh gets distracted by the world. It's a recurring theme in, in the Hebrew Bible, in what we call the Old Testament. We see it in the book of Judges. We see it in the book of Kings. We see it in Chronicles. We see it in, in Genesis. We see it in Exodus. We see it in every book of the Bible. But it's when that relationship with God is broken that this occurs. Gideon's family worshipped a lot of gods. Instead of tending the garden, he was threshing wheat in a wine press. The world, and we live in a culture that it's all about consuming, right? We are bombarded with images 
of things that we should be desiring and how it's going to solve all our problems. That car, that house, that woman, that man, these clothes, this hairstyle, this music. It's all going to solve your problems. The people in the commercial look extremely happy. It's a charade. It's not real life. We're living real life. There's no satisfaction in the things of the world. The world offers only moments. God offers more. God offers stability. God offers eternity. We love the world and all its distractions. Getting in and his family were distracted by other gods. Children of Israel knew God. How could this happen? Well, how can it happen? Well, incremental compromises and accommodations with the world. Till we don't even perceive that what, what's happening. Years ago, many years ago, nearly 40 years, over 40 years ago now, I uh, was a young man, a musician, and I wanted to learn uh, how to be a recording engineer so I could record my own music. So I went to this school, and it was in Reverend B. Chillicothe, Ohio, the great state of Ohio, I say. I flew into Columbus, and from Columbus to Chillicothe is about 40 miles or so. So someone picks us up, there was, more, uh, there was a few of us on the plane, uh, and we get driven to Chillicothe. On our way to Chillicothe from Columbus, we pass by a paper mill. Now, some of you may know this, some of you may not know this, this might be new information. The process of making paper involves breaking down wood into pulp, which is a process that stinks. Okay, it is awful. We're f we, we are driving down the highway and, you, and the smell first hits you. Now, it's faint, but you know it's something. And we were, in a, we were in a van, and, and as we continued to get closer to ground zero, the more and more acrid and pungent this smell becomes. So finally we get closer, to, and I, I asked the driver, I said, what is that? Because he's not reacting. And he says, oh, it's the, it's the paper plant. I forget which paper plant it was or what the manufacturer is, but... He sa and he says this, and I never forgot this, uh, not thinking that 40 years later I'd be using it in a message on a Sunday. He says to us, all of us, oh, you'll get used to it in a day or so. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm from New Jersey, man. I, I know what bad smells like. You don't get used to that. Well, anyway, we make our way to Chillicothe, which is another 20 miles outside of, and, but you can still smell this. And it's not like you can't smell it. Anyway, Two days later, didn't smell it anymore. Got used to it. Hmm. Got used to it. So you can get used to something that is at first offensive. Hmm? That smell was oh, it was awful. Well, you can get used to sin too. You can get used to doing wrong. You can get used to this breaking, shifting ground with God until sin is no longer recognizable, like the frog in the slowly boiling pot. And we have plenty of distractions to go around, plenty, in this country. Our cell phones, windows to good and bad, Again, these are choices, right? We have the ability to choose, right? God doesn't compel us to choose. He gives us the power to choose, and then that, that choice is on us, right? That choice is on us. And as I'm thinking about our, our, our communication and cell phone life, I think of the, uh, uh, I think it's ironic that the, Manufacturer of probably the most popular handheld devices on the planet and laptop computers and so forth is a company whose logo is an apple with a bite taken out of it. 
which is also ironic because that is not what the Bible says. <laughs> it's not an apple in the Bible, it's fruit. So that's the world, again, misinterpreting scripture. Okay, that's another one I'll just give you for free. <clears throat> Let's turn to uh, the, cha- the uh, book of Mark as, uh, as we bring this closer to a conclusion. Now, Jesus in, uh, in Mark chapter 8, starting in, in verse 31, it says, And he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man, the referring to himself, Ben Adam, in the, in the Hebrew would, would be, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. God gave his orders in the garden, in paradise, in Eden, to Adam openly and freely. Adam made his choice. So, He spoke this word openly, and then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He's saying to Jesus, no, 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 no. You can't die. You're the Messiah. You're going to be the king that that frees us from all this, this Roman rule, these Pharisees and Sadducees. And Jesus says to him, But when he had turned, Jesus had turned around and he looked at his disciples. He rebukes Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. We have to be mindful of the things of God. Make it a daily practice. Have God be on your mind. In your mind, not just on your mind, in your mind. Let God inhabit you. God's Holy Spirit is there for us. God is in us. Keep looking for God. The more you see God in yourself, the more you're going to see God in others. The easier it's going to be to forgive others. And to be at peace, true peace. Not something bought and put in the driveway. Mm -hmm. But, so he rebukes Satan, uh, Peter, and, and identifies him with Satan. And that's, that's important, what he's saying there. Don't look at me that way. Look at my spirit. Understand what I'm telling you, Jesus is saying to him. When he called the people to himself uh, with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me. Here, here, here's Jesus' formula for discipleship. Whoever decides to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever decides to come after me, <clears throat> to follow him, not only in that moment, but now, and every moment since then, then let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. He doesn't say take up my cross. We can't bear Christ's cross. We were all on that cross. We were all part of that burden. Hmm? Jesus says take up your cross. Whatever your cross is, we all have them. We call them troubles. We call them whatever. Disease, heartbreak. Emotional break, loss, whatever it is. We all have it. It's, it's, it's our decline narrative. But there's a solution to our decline, and that's a relationship with God. It's this discipleship. What does he mean by this? Well, deny is a state. To state that something is not true, you can deny it. That's not what he's talking about here. That's not the connotation of the word he's using. It's, he's saying, Jesus is saying, to lose sight of oneself and one's own interest. To look to someone else first, ahead of yourself. A person that tends the garden looks at the bigger picture, puts the interests 
and welfare of others above their own. And for men, including young men, and I hope you're out there listening, young men who are trying hard to do the right thing, it's essential to have a relationship with God for all of us. You need God in your life. God makes things clear, and if you desire clarity in all your decision-making, strengthen your relationship with God, and he'll equip you with what you need to deny yourself. Hmm. You don't recognize it as self-denial at that point in that relationship. You're not like Gideon. You're not looking at yourself in the mirror as this less than. <clears throat> Take up your cross. It's a burden. Why do it? I saw this cartoon once uh, on Facebook, right, of all places. And, uh, and it's this. There's these cartoon characters. Um, they're just drawings. And they all have a cross. They all have this. They're dragging this large, heavy, burdensome cross behind them. <clears throat> and uh, one of the characters gets on his knees and appeals to God, please, please, please lessen the burden of this cross. After some praying, some of the length is cut off the uh, vertical portion of the cross. We go further. He's still having trouble with the burden. He prays again. The vertical piece becomes shorter. He prays one more time. And now the cross becomes so easy to bear, and he thanks God. He's so happy. And then he and all the others who now have long, the, the original long cross get to a, ch a chasm, a break, a cliff. Everyone else puts their cross down and walks across. Our friend, who has broken, has this shallow relationship with God and doesn't want to bear the full cross, well, his cross is too small, and he can't put it down to get him across to the other side. Carrying the cross strengthens us and prepares us for what we are going to face down the road, the things that God can see that we cannot see. That's faith. That's what our faith is. And, then fi and finally, third step that Jesus tells us is to follow him, to follow Jesus. Read the word. Read the gospels. Understand what Jesus did for us, and how he did it, and why he did it. Examine the words of Jesus. Parse them. Meditate on them. Pray on them. Appreciate them. Now, the only way to follow Jesus is to do steps in one and two, right? Deny yourself and take up your cross. It leads to step three automatically. Know his word. Apply his word. Have a prayer life. Discipleship is important. It's important in my life. I'm sure it's important in your life as well. well. I hope it is. I love God and my discipleship with God because God gave me more chances than my sins deserve. Life happens to all of us. But a life with God is better than a life without God. So look to God. Look at God. Remember that litany of, of characters earlier in, in the message of Jeremiah and Moses and Mary and Paul? <clears throat> Gideon, we see. We don't have to be capable. We don't have to be brave. We just have to be willing. God doesn't have to fix us first. <laughs> this is where I miss everybody. Redemption is not about repair. Redemption is about healing. Even Jesus' wounds weren't healed when he was raised from the dead. Okay? He still bore the wounds in his hands, in his side, to show the doubting Thomas. God can use us all in our incompetence, in our doubt, and in our fear. All we have to do is to be willing to try. Picture yourself differently. We are more than what we struggle with. You are more than what you struggle with. 
You might be struggling with something on this day. You are more than that. God sees more in you. And with God, you are stronger than you are without God. We need to look at ourselves and decide, do I want to tend my garden with God? Or do I want to thresh wheat in a wine press without him? Someone in your life, someone you may not even know yet, they need you. They don't need someone else. They need you. They need you in your strength, in your relationship, in your discipleship with God, with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, your prayer life, your understanding of the word, your willingness to carry your cross. No one can do it like you can. Don't miss your purpose. Don't miss your purpose. We should live a life of purpose, and with God, you can live a life of purpose, a life that impacts not only your family, which is first important, your community, which is important, your society, your culture. Lord, how, what else has to happen where we are in this place today in 2021? Everybody was so looking forward to the calendar changing. Well, okay, the calendar changed, but humans have not changed. We have to be willing to change. The calendar is an artificial uh, uh, measurement of time. It's a hope. But it's only hope if we don't use our relationship with God to strengthen us and to help others. That's where it begins. It begins in us. And our choice, our decision, Adam and Eve, dis Eve decided to eat the fruit. Adam decided to stand there and be silent. Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press, out of position. His whole society was under attack and under siege. And he saw himself as something else than what God saw him as. And at the end of the story, Gideon does with 300 men and no weapons, when you read the story, and I invite you to read the, the whole story, defeats the Midianites. We don't have to be perfect to be used by God. Eden wasn't perfect. It was a perfect opportunity. So don't lose your opportunity. Tend your guard. Carry your cross. Tend your garden. Carry your cross. Stay encouraged. Be blessed. Amen and amen again. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. I pray that it falls into the hearts and the spirits of those who heard it. And it grows and it takes root. And it informs our activity and our agency in the world to make this a better place as we carry our cross and love and help others. And there may be some of you under the sound of my voice who would like this discipleship with Jesus. And it is not something difficult to do. You don't have to do any kind of trial. All you have to do is open your heart and your spirit and say, Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died and were raised from the dead by God. And by that belief, and by that faith, you're saved. You're set free. And you're delivered. I thank you for being with us on this day, on this Sunday. I ask God to bless you and your families as we go through this year. I pray for us this year. I see the hope 
this year, let us work together in our discipleship with God. Let us deny ourselves. Let us take up our crosses. Let us follow Jesus. Let us tend our garden. Let's guard it. Let's protect it. And let's till it and make it productive. God bless you. Stay encouraged and be blessed. Thank you for joining today's broadcast. Please visit us on our website at rolcm.org.